All right, hello everybody. Sorry for that delay. Um, some technical issues on the back end, uh, but we appeared to have gotten them straightened out. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's program will be about the USS Mississippi. Um, but uh, before we start, I just wanna let you know about a couple of upcoming events. Um, next week at noon, August 21st, uh, we will have a uh, program about Confederate pirates and the capture of the steamership St. Nicholas. Um, and then following week, uh, the 28th uh, at noon, we'll have a little bit of different thing. Instead of Civil War history per se, it'll be uh, Hampton Roads history. And that'll be about the founding of Newport News. Um, and so uh, like always, uh, you know, we appreciate your uh, participation in these. Um, if you want more information, uh, we do have a blog and that is blog.marinersmuseum.org. And there you'll find information related to the programs that you're seeing a little bit more in depth, uh, as well as a lot of other cool stuff uh, about just things that the museum has going on uh, from conservation to archives and such. Uh, so uh, at the end, we'll be having a Q&A session. So if you could, uh, if you had any questions, just throw them in that live chat. And um, so without further ado, uh, like and subscribe. And uh, John, why don't you take it away? Hello, my name is John Corstein. Of course, I'm the uh, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariners Museum. This is part of our digital outreach uh, that uh, is actually working rather well. Uh, and so we're going to continue this for some time. And I'm going to uh, also alter some of my programs so that I can make them uh, a more... Uh, I guess, inclusive, so to speak. Uh, so you'll see that as we go through some of our great stories we have planned. Today, we're going to talk about the ship of the Manifest Destiny, the USS Mississippi. Now, I got to tell you that the Mississippi, um, why do I call it a link to the Manifest Destiny? Because as you know, the um, Americans were moving westward. They thought it was their right. In fact, many thought it was their divine right to fill the rest of the continent from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific. And uh, and this was really, it, it sounds like it's a really wonderful thing that they wanted to actually, <clears throat> uh, you know, colonize these areas. Uh, if you didn't fall into... Uh, a certain group like uh, Manifest Destiny sounds very lofty. Yeah, let's go and civilize the wilderness as part of our, you know, expansion of our industrial and agricultural might. But actually, this westward expansion was only for people of European descent. It did not include slaves unless the slaves came with the Europeans. And it also uh, uh, meant that the Native Americans would be displaced and killed. And the Hispanics were going to be either integrated into the Anglo-Saxon way um, or overwhelmed. So the westward expansion mo movement brought notable advancements to the United States, but like so much about history, it also had a dark side. I got that from Star Wars. So anyway, um, the Mississippi is uh, really a tremendous example of the Manifest Destiny because it's an excellent example of American ingenuity, industrial growth, mercantile expansion, and it exceptionalism. Whoa, and that's because it had stellar service during the Mexican War. It actually opened the door to Ch Japan. And furthermore, uh, it would fight to make sure our nation stayed as one. So the man most, uh, next slide, man that's most responsible for uh, the, um, um, most responsible for uh, is this man. This man is Matthew Galbraith Perry. And Perry, of course, is the younger brother of Oliver Hazard Perry. And you see him in the great painting where Perry is moving across from one ship to the, from the Niagara to Saratoga. And he's trying to pull his brother from standing up with the flag, don't give up the ship. So anyway, he is a War of 1812 veteran. However, he had the wisdom to realize the arrow's sail power is over. 
is going to be replaced by steam power. And so he lobbied for the U.S. Navy to become uh, enter the ships of the steam age. He also advocated to use, based on uh, um, Paxenhan's, uh, Henry Paxenhan's uh, two books, uh, that they have an integrated battery of the same calibers and that they all be shell guns. So that is a critical change. Um, and so in, uh, he actually starts on this at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1833, where he'll work on the steam powered the second USS Fulton. Now, this was really a steamer designed for coastal defense, but when it was commissioned uh, with a newly promoted Captain M.C. Perry in command, he used it as a gunnery platform and uh, for testing. Now, he gets promoted flag officer in 1840 while he's building the first two real critical steam powered ships for the US Navy. Uh, that would be, this is the picture of the Fulton as you can see, um, limited. Now what the big thing about a paddler is that you uh, limited your broadsides. And so that was a big problem for uh, Naval leaders, but uh, it also, these steam paddles enabled you to go anywhere you want. Next slide. And so uh, uh, you can see the Fulton again in this image. Um, and uh, uh, it really hung out in New York Harbor is that all as it did. But the Mississippi is going to be laid down at the Brooklyn Navy Yard while at the same time the Missouri, uh, or sorry, the Missouri was laid down at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And at the same time, the Mississippi is laid down at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. And Perry went back and forth uh, supervising the ships. This is a great view of the Mississippi. Notice, all the sails. Now, I got to tell you that the big shots in the U.S. Navy at that time weren't all so much sure about the steam power. Steam power also had a limited range because of the excess amount of coal it used. So this is showing the Mississippi drying its sails, um, and it's probably around 1863, the image. Now, what makes uh, these ships, the Missouri and the Mississippi, so important? They're 229 feet long. They have 40-foot beams and 20.6 feet draft, okay? So they're fairly effective. The Mississippi is going to be launched on 15 um, May 1841 and commissioned in December of 1841. Now, it's the most modern warship, so it's assigned to the um, home squadron, and the Missouri is going to be assigned to the Mediterranean um, squadron, so we can kind of say, look what we've got now. Now, both ships, believe it or not, they're still in, the, the engine they're using is like is powered by side level engine with cylinder 75 inches in diameter with a seven foot stroke. Oh my gosh, these are capital frigates. Now, I just want you all to remember and that uh, uh, they uh, could make uh, with sail uh, 12 knots. So that's just means there they've got pretty good speed. Now they can only carry 10 guns. Uh, however, in broadside, we would have um, eight, uh, this is a Paxenhan style shell gun, 32 pounder. Um, and uh, basically you can see the banding on it that's gonna be perfected by uh, other people like Dahlgren and uh, John Mercer Brook. Uh, so anyway, and then it also had two 10 inch pivot shell guns. So, you know, they had pretty strong firepower with those. Um, now, what's, what's gonna change as soon as these ships come out, Ericsson is going to invent, what, the screw propeller. So these ships are somewhat archaic, but everyone else hasn't changed to the screw propeller alignment. Now I have to tell you the Missouri was burned accidentally at, um, what is known in Gibraltar, and actually some sailor knocked over some turpentine and poof, it uh, caught on fire and 
no lives were lost, but the ship was lost. And this is just off the harbor of Gibraltar. So uh, the Missouri would then become, uh, or the Mississippi would become the flagship of the home squadron and commanded directly by Commodore Matthew Galbraith Perry. Now they blockaded along the um, Mexican coast, but more importantly, some of the guns were taken off of the Mississippi and with the aid of the engineer, Captain Robert E. Lee, they are gonna be in place to bombard the port city into submission, which it does do so. The rapid capture of Veracruz allowed the U.S. Army to move down the national road towards Mexico City, away from, uh, you know, the yellow fever uh, epidemics that often happened in Veracruz. When the war was over, the Mississippi uh, then uh, uh, went uh, up to the Gosport Navy Yard for a refit, and then it went to Europe commanded by Commander Sidney Smith Lee. Smith Lee is the brother, of course, of R.E. Lee. He, um, with his mission by act of Congress, was to go and save the famous Hungarian. You know, in 1848, there were revolutions throughout Europe, um, basically uh, you know, trying to have more parliamentary governance installed. Many subject states under a larger power wanted to be their own nation. Uh, Kosuk was a Hungarian noble, uh, and he uh, you know, was, was so noble that we had to go save him because he was looking for independence and a, a representative style of governance. So here we send our best ship uh, all the way to, uh, um, to the Mediterranean to pick up Kosuth and bring him back to um, bring him back. He decides not to go back to um, America. He has the Mississippi take him up to London where he's feeded and everything. And then he comes to America. Actually, most people thought he was a bore, uh, but nevertheless, he was a symbolic hero for the Hungarians. So then the ship is going to be assigned to the Cristo expedition to open Japan to trade. Wow, look at this. That, you see this um, Japanese showing the fleet coming in, right? But then we see with all the black smoke, and at this time, the Mississippi had two funnels, and, um, and there they are, belching smoke. And the Japanese had never seen anything like this before. And so he uh, actually, Perry, rendezvoused with several sailing ships like the USS uh, Plymouth, but also the newest paddler known as the USS Susquehanna. Next slide. Um, and this is the Susquehanna right there. Um, basically, uh, there were slight improvements done with this ship, but it still had limited firepower. Next. Um, and so um, while there, this, the, I don't know how many of y'all collected stamps, but I had this one, uh, I still do. Um, and of course, Commodore Perry, Matthew Galbraith Perry, you see his likeness uh, to the right. And then you see the two paddlers that are going to make the Japanese shogunate go, oh my God, we're behind the times. These are the steam powered paddle wheels and that shocked them. And so they sign a treaty and every uh, the treaty is kind of Ghana, Guana, um, I think. Um, and um, so the steamer then went to the East India Squadron as flagship of Commodore Josiah Tattenall, right? And he is there during the second Opium War. Um, then what happens is the ship is returned to Charleston Navy Yard. It will be placed into uh, ordinary. Um, and then when it looks like war clouds are coming to America, it will be taken out of ordinary, refitted, and placed under the command of Captain uh, Metalcon Tun Smith. And, uh, uh, and he is assigned to the Gulf Blockading Squadron. 
Uh, temporarily, he is going to be in command, um, but um, so he'll for a little bit have a rank of flag officer. Then once the blockading board recognizes they have to split the two um, blockading squadrons into the East Gulf blockading squadron and the West Gulf blockading squadron. And the West blockading squadron, West Gulf, Gulf blockading squadron is going to be commanded by none other than Matthew Galbraith Perry, or excuse me, David Glasgow Farragut. Now, we just saw a picture of, um, uh, of Smith. This is a picture of someone who's going to play a big role in what the Mississippi does while it is in um, the uh, Mississippi River. In fact, trying to get it over the sandbar was laborious. I had to run the ship into the sandbar, back up and run it in again. It finally got over the bar and Farragut says, now we'll be okay. Dewey, George Dewey of Manila Bay fame is right there, a lieutenant, and he is, of course, uh, executive officer. Now, I talked about the Battle of New Orleans before, but I just want to talk a little bit about the Mississippi's role in the Battle of the Forts, as we call it. On April 24, uh, 1862, uh, uh, basically, um, the Mississippi is the lead ship that helps guide the 17th Squadron past the forts and through the Confederate naval forces. And Farragut, remember, when the battle opened up, it was as if an artillery of heaven played upon the earth. Now, the Confederates have one really working ironclad, if you want to call it that. I already talked about it previously, and that is the Manassas, which you see here. Now, the Manassas, uh, I think I've explained in detail, but it's got a ram, and it can make about six knots. It had one gun, and you can see the gun sticking out of the gun port. Uh, however, it was, you had to really get out of the ship to you know reload it so it was kind of ineffectual you got one shot and so the the, the ram as most people call it was uh comes into action she tries to ram the brooklyn um and uh then she heads at the mana uh, the mississippi which you can see in the foreground there and the mississippi of course uh, Alexander Warley, the commander of the Manassas, will head straight for the paddle wheel. Go back to the other side, please. Um, and go and try to ruin that paddle wheel because that would stop the Mississippi dead in the water. Instead, Dewey turns it slightly, and so it runs along the side of the Hartford of the Mississippi and it cuts in about six inches. In fact, Dewey looks down, and you can see all the copper bolts holding the structure together. Had it had a better aim, the Mississippi would have sunk. Actually, the ship is going to ram the Brooklyn, and because the Brooklyn had chains run down the side of it, it will, of course, uh, uh, be a, not do as much damage, but it does break through the first two layers of planking on the Brooklyn. It then tries to ram the Hartford. The Hartford maneuvers out of way, but, uh, you know, the Hartford is, uh, you know, that's where Farragut is. And, and he sees that ship go by and he uses a, a, a you know, a, 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 I forget what it's called, you know, funnel uh, device speaking tube. And he will shout towards the Mississippi uh, to Smith saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, run, he, Smith needed to run down that rascally rebel ram. Oh my God. So Dewey stops one engine, full power on the other. So his ship turns around and it goes back down river after the Manassas. Now, very shortly thereafter, it will catch up with the Manassas. It will fire its broadside and both pivot guns into the Manassas. Manassas runs up on a water bank and is on fire. And the comment that Dewey will make is, we left her with a few more portholes. In other words, uh, you know, they 
broke through the limited armor. It's like 1.25 inches armor. So the Mississippi cannot go up uh, the Mississippi uh, by that time of the year. So she stays in New Orleans as Farragut takes his fleet up to Vicksburg. Then as the water falls, he brings it back down. Now by early, late winter, um, it will be March 14th, actually. Um, Farragut wants to run his ships past what is known as Port Hudson. And Port Hudson is a very uh, important citadel on the Mississippi. Um, P PGT Beauregard actually suggested it, and the man that built it was Major General Franklin Gardner, a New Yorker, also a West Point graduate, um, and so he will build his fortifications. Um, now, the Union plan was for this man, this is uh, Major General Nathaniel Prentice um, Banks, and I got to tell you, Banks is a a great politician, great speaker, but a terrible general. Anyway, he meets with Farragut, and the idea is on May, March 15th, that Banks was going to attack the land side of Port Hudson as Farragut runs past. Well, Farragut thinks about it, doesn't want his ships to be seen, you know, as they're passing as best possible. So what they do is he plans to run past them. Each of his ships are going to be prepared or paired with another vessel, such as the Hartford with the Albatross, the Richmond with the Genesee, and the Mangahelia attacks to the Kena. The Mississippi was a, on by itself because it was a paddle wheel. Now, this uh, battle is going to go bad <laughs> right from the beginning. Uh, next slide. And so um, on the afternoon of March 14th, uh, good old Farragut says, I'm, I'm not going to wait for tomorrow. I'm running past the batteries tonight. So that's exactly what he does. And um, uh, basically began at 10 p.m. Uh, the Hartford began its move upriver. Um, the Confederates, as soon as they saw this ghostly image in the water, they lit these pine knot bonfires on the side, uh, opposite side of the river western side of the Mississippi and set up flares and rockets and so that the whole scene was illuminated and then they started firing their guns. Well, I have to tell you right away that uh, the Farragut will run aground um, because they get blinded by all the smoke. Just remember, you got black smoke from the engines you have kind of gray smoke coming from the pine knot fires and black smoke from uh, the smokestacks and then white smoke from the gunpowder. So these ships are shrouded in smoke. However, what happens is the Hartford, when it's making the final bend, it will um, uh, run aground and it get pounded for a little while, but it's able to get off the sandbar and go past Port Hudson. I got to tell you, the Riley fleet is going to have a big problem because uh, as the Richmond passes the um, uh, the batteries, now remember, Port Hudson has 20 heavy seacoast guns and they all know where to shoot. And so the Richmond is trying to pass the water batteries. A breeze picks up blows the smoke away so the Confederates could see right at uh, the Richmond. And so they pounded it. The ship was riddled. Uh, a 32-pounder rifle chill uh, plunged through the deck, striking off the boiler, boiler safety valve, and the Richmond stopped dead in the water, and the ship was filled with steam. The Genesee lacked the power to move the ship sloop forward. So as a result of that, uh, they will drift back down the river. The Mangahela and Kino, it's their turn to try and go past. What will happen is the Mangahela will actually uh, run aground. And as they run aground, the Kino separates from it. And while that happened, a shot breaks off 
the rudder post of the Tino, so it can't go anywhere. And then the Mangahila's bridge had a shell that destroyed it. And then the hull was heavily damaged by shot. And as the engineers tied down their safety valves, used cock waste to produce more power, the sloop was somehow able to pull off the sandbar. This caused Mangahila's engines to overheat and break down. So that too would float back down the river. Here comes the Mississippi. And as they, they see the other ships floating back down, this is another view of the Mangahila under sail. Um, I got to tell you, the next slide, the, what's going to happen is the Mississippi. And you can see this is how the Confederates is one of their uh, gun crews shooting down into the river. Um, the Mississippi's turn comes, and I got to tell you, in the smoke-filled darkness. Um, Commander Smith, or Captain Smith, um, saw the Richmond drifting down the river, and so it will uh, say, oh my gosh, um, we're out of line, and he orders his ship to move forward at full steam. Now, I gotta tell you, they have to go ahead fast to sort of to break this, um, what we call a gap, However, it was hitting that one final bend in the river when um, it ran aground on a shoal. Oh my gosh. And it's right there at the last water battery that is able to pound the Mississippi. Now, what's going to happen is after 35 minutes, uh, the Mississippi has been holed, its shells have started fires on it. So, Smith and is there to say, okay, we have to abandon ship. Uh, Dewey was able to get everybody off, although they did have 64 men killed on the Mississippi. Uh, but once all the people alive and wounded were off the paddler, it became almost engulfed with flames. Dewey has the wherewithal to run through the ship, spiking all the guns so the Confederates couldn't have them. And I have to tell you that you know, when you lose 64 of 233 men crew, that's devastating, right? Uh, roughly one third of your crew has been killed. Now, um, what will happen is that the Confederates um, are going to be able to um, watch the ship burn. And in fact, several men will receive uh, the Medal of Honor. This is the Hartford, the only ship to make it through the firestorm. And so Seaman Alexander Brown remained on the grounded vessel until all the abandoned crew had landed on the shore. Uh, basically, a Marine Sergeant uh, Vaughn, Pinkerton Vaughn, believe it or not, and he is persisted till the last and conspicuously coolly under heavy fire to, to help rescue everyone off the ship. I'm going to tell you right now, Vaughn was by Smith that you need to save yourself as you see fit. So we have two Medal of Honor recipients on the Hartford. Now the Hartford, what does it mean? Well, the, I mean the Mississippi. The Mississippi, as soon as it launched, it was archaic, but still it was a steam-powered vessel. It was involved in the conquest of Mexico. It was involved in the opening of the uh, um, Japan to American um, commerce, and furthermore, uh, it symbolized not only this manifest destiny, but also America's entry into becoming a world power. So the USS Mississippi, the paddler that went, never did circumnavigate the world, but it did operate in Asia, operate in the Gulf, operated in Mediterranean, when it saved Kusuth, and doing all those things made it one of the favorite vessels of many officers, including the likes of uh, Dewey, uh, Melchon Smith, and of course, David Glasgow Farragut. Oh my gosh. So anyway, that's what makes the Mississippi so important. It's uh, destruction, um, 1863. Um, actually, Farragut, who only got his ship passed, and he was able to blockade the mouth of the Red River, he reported 
say his skin, that oh, the loss of the Mississippi was well worth opening or blockading the Red River because the Red River could bring supplies to Vicksburg and Port Hudson. So kind of closed off that flow of supplies. The Mississippi, a uh, major paddler, uh, may only frigate paddler that we're using in a main way, that in the Susquehanna during the Civil War, because we've all turned to what? Screw propellers. But nevertheless, Mississippi has a combat record that is uh, beyond compare in the 19th century. So anyway, uh, that's the story about the Mississippi. I don't know if you have any questions for me. Um, and uh, I think I'm going to see them now. Yeah, we've got, got a few questions here, John. Um, so the first question is, uh, the paddle, did the paddle ships have uh, trouble crossing the oceans, like especially with large waves? Um, you know, basically, um, it operated mostly under sail. You get your steam power up because you had other equipment that operated the pumps, uh, the condensers, uh, all those types of things operated um, to, uh, so you had to keep your steam power up, but you didn't have to use it to use your paddlers. Now, when they came to Japan, they come right, they used their paddlers because they had to kind of say, look, look what we can do. So they dropped all their sails. Really, um, steamers of the pre-Civil War, the Hartford class, the Merrimack class, um, Mississippi class, the Susquehanna class, they're all designed to operate primarily under sail. The steam power gave them the chance to maneuver in battle in a way that gave them an advantage over coastal batteries, over also... Uh, sailing ship so they weren't when they were in a heavy storm they were using their sails generally speaking there is a painting of this expedition um which was unavailable to use but uh shows them in a storm off of japan and there's steam coming out but it doesn't look like their paddles are moving to any great extent they still would move based on the waves uh, but uh, they're under canvas Okay. Great. Um, so the next question here is, to what extent was Japan a naval power in this part of the 19th century? Well, if you consider junks with smoothbore uh, bronze cannon using junks using sails against a ship armed with shell guns and steam power, they were not <clears throat> a naval power at all. Actually, what's going to happen in Japan is what is called the Meiji Restoration, where they will overthrow the shogunate and the emperor himself um, will become in charge. And once they've stopped all the dissidents that's out in Japan, they then send um, representatives to America to understand our industry to Germany to understand their army, to England to understand their navy. And they actually, their first steam-powered ship, which I have not talked about yet, is the U or CSS Stonewall, a ship made in France for the Confederate Navy. It gets to America after the war is over. So the American government sells it to Japan. So uh, it becomes... Uh, their first steam-powered warship, ironclad, no less. So, so they become a naval power after the Civil War. So what else? Okay, do we well, have? That, that looks like uh, all the questions. Oh my gosh! Um, well, I want to thank you all so much. I, mean, I thought I'd get a question as Destiny, uh, but uh, I think I explained it well enough um, at the beginning uh, so that. Um, uh, you know, Manifest Destiny seems like a great period in American history, as we're learning in the modern world that, um, you know, basically history has a good side and a bad side to it all. And so um, yeah, we have to look on the Manifest Destiny in, in several different ways. 
uh, not always in a good way. Um, I want to encourage you all uh, to contact me um, directly if you wish. Uh, my email address is J-O-H-N-Q-U-A-R-S-T-E-I-N at gmail.com. In other words, John Corstein at gmail. And uh, so you can send me questions. I'd also love to know what other types of programs you would like. I, I plan programs six months in advance. In other words, all the way through March, I already know what I'm talking about, like next week. Um, I can't even, oh yeah, I'm talking about uh, the capture of the St. Nicholas and this guy known as Richard Thomas Arana. Uh, it's a fabulous story. Um, and so uh, basically you can send me an email and send me some suggestions as to what you might like to know more about uh, the natives during the Civil War. Um, you know, I uh, have written extensively, I think I've written five books about it. In fact, if you want any of my books, I think online, you can get them from the Mariners Museum gift shop. I want to make sure these programs that I do uh, are really meeting your needs. This is part of our digital approach at the museum. By meeting your needs, um, we meet our own needs. And so I'd love to get your, in, your feedback. And until next Friday, I just want to say a great uh, huzzah, or maybe I should say instead, to sink before surrender. Because the Mississippi never hauled down her flag and actually floated down river to war when she's burning and abandoned the ship. They floated down river and the explosion um, was heard um, 80 miles away in New Orleans. But it so, as Franklin Buchanan said on the CSS Virginia, sink before surrender. That's what all these officers felt. So, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, thank you on behalf of the Mariners Museum and Park, um, your interest in the museum and our new digital programming, uh, I think is just awesome. We want to make it to meet your needs and wishes. So, uh, anyway, let me know. And until next week, Simply for surrender. Thank you.